Well, brethren, one of the things that really impressed my wife and I when we first came to understand and learn about the truth was that there, that there was meaning and purpose behind the observances of God's Sabbath and holy days. Now, I know that we are looked by other people as being strange because we eat matzah for a whole week. We wind up having to clean out our houses, our garage, our car from all the leaven that we had been collecting from the donuts that we were eating on the way home from work or whatever we were doing. So we are looked at a little odd by people like that. Yet it's perfectly normal in the world today that rabbits can lay colored eggs and that the families would hide them in the, in the backyard so that their kids later on could come out and pick them all up somehow. So that's considered normal, but not our eating matzahs. So actually, God instructs us, brethren, that we ought to know why we do what we do in our life on every aspect, and not just follow the crowd, but that each Sabbath and holy day that we look to God's word to be sure that we understand the meaning behind these days that we are keeping. Now again, they have meaning and purpose. We know that everything that God does has a purpose and meaning for it but especially the holy days as we are approaching now that we're going to be seeing the importance of what these days all mean for us. So today we're going to see more about unleavened bread, what it represents for us, and what we must focus on on that week that we will be observing it, what it represents for us. Let's turn over to Leviticus chapter 23 first. Leviticus chapter 23 is a review of God's command to Israel of what he wanted them to be doing. Leviticus chapter 23. We'll read in verse, 20, verse 1, where he says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Now he's given this whole a series here in uh, Leviticus 23, as an outline and overview of the holy days. And he does it in a chronological order. So they're all listed in the way that they are to be observed and kept as well. So here he's saying that they are to, uh, he says that these holy, holy convocations, and even these are my feasts. Now he says these feast days are his. They're not man's feast days. They're not our feast days, or they're not the Jews' feast days. He says, these are my feast days. So how much more important would they be than however we look at the things we've seen at in the past, whether it's rabbits or something else that they're doing? So we understand then he's, he's showing the emphasis of what's important, that these are his feast. Verse 3, he says, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. So again, now he's emphasizing that these are holy convocations. Verse 5, and the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So he's letting us know here that these holy days are holy days of con uh, being together. We are to gather together holy convocations. And we're doing that by we pray together, we sing God's praises together, we fellowship together, we spend time talking about God's word, we're being here to listen to messages that God has prepared for us to know something about. These are holy convocations, how important they are. And he says, seven days that you must eat unleavened bread during this holy during this time well, let's turn over to exodus chapter 12 exodus chapter 12 the first 14 verses which we won't be reading that but the first 14 verses are the passover instruction that god has given to israel at that time first of all he was he was letting them know they were to kill the lamb they were to put blood on the doorposts from the lamb that they killed they were to eat a meal that that night and, that, uh, and then God would pass over the land at that time in Egypt, and the firstborn of the people would be killed. Exodus chapter 12, let's read in verse 15. When you give them the overall outline of what's going on, we see here in verse 15, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. 
Now, again, he's showing here very serious instruction that he's giving, that they would be cut off. And so it's to remember what the meaning is of the day, that it's important. that If they don't do it, they're going to be cut off, meaning removed from Israel. Now, we don't just look at that as the, the land of Israel, because we, we, brethren, are spiritual Israel. And if we're not obeying what God says on these holy days, then we will be cut off from Israel, spiritual Israel, from God's family. So he, again, he's told, told them to eat unleavened bread. Now, 12 times in different places in the Old Testament, that term is used to eat unleavened bread seven days. Interesting. 12 times it's mentioned. Not once, not twice, not three times, but 12 times he's bringing out and reminding everyone that they are to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, humanly, we can look back at this and say, well, come on, that's cardboard bread. A matzah? Really? You know, why is that a big deal? So why not just skip the bread since it doesn't look to be so important in what it is? Rather, because it represents something for us. That unleavened bread represents something for us that we are to be sure we're taking. It's not a ritual. It's not just being obedient to what God says. It's more than that. There's a purpose and a meaning, meaning for that unleavened bread that we have to see. Continuing in Exodus 12 and verse 16, it says that in the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done therein, except that which every man must eat, and that only may be done to you. So you, they can prepare a meal and eat it, but not unleavened bread. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for this selfsame day I have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day in your generation forever. Now, it's not just for that one time, he's saying. It's not just the Old Testament that's to be done. He's saying this is to be done forever. Right in the millennium, when Christ returns, it's going to be kept on for all of God's holy days forever. Verse 18, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and 21st day, uh, the one and 21st day of that month at even. Verse 19, seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats that which is leavened, even that soul shall again be cut off from the, con from the congregation of Israel. Whether he be a stranger or born in the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations, you shall eat unleavened bread. So Israel, brethren, did not understand the spiritual meaning behind the Passover and unleavened bread. How being, how, uh, being enslaved to Egypt really was a type of sin. They didn't see that. They just thought this has to do with them leaving the land and being set free from the bondage of uh, Pharaoh. But yet he says that they didn't see the meaning and the purpose behind this and the need for the blood to be shed to make that freedom possible, that they were killing the lamb, putting the blood on the doorpost, but they didn't see that as the importance of being freed spiritually from that sin. Let's turn over to Galatians chapter, five, uh, chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, we'll see here now the spiritual, again, application. Galatians chapter 1, and we'll begin in verse 3. Galatians 1 and verse 3, it says, Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God our Father. So we know, brethren, that God died for, uh, for us to deliver us from sin. Because we've been in bondage like Israel was for all those years. We've been in bondage now for 6,000 years to the human mind of sin that we are living with. And that's to be, uh, before freedom from bondage, we have to understand that the blood must be shed. Because it said in Galatians that he gave himself for us, that he could deliver us. Well, he gave up his life, his blood, so, and suffering so that we can be freed from that bondage. So just as Israel, we are delivered from the bondage of sin. And after we accept his sacrifice, we must leave that spiritual Israel, uh, spiritual Egypt that we've been living in. So again, this week that we're looking at in the future, next month, this week doesn't picture putting out sin. 
We already did that before Unleavened Bread. As we start working now, uh, some of us are already looking at things we need to get rid of in the house and uh, in the car or whatever. Uh, so this doesn't picture just that at that day, but it's already been done. The physical leaven has been removed. This week is about eating that flat bread and what it signifies for us and what it should do for us. That's what it represents, that week. Because on leaven bread, we've already removed the sin. We've already removed the leaven out of the house, symbolic of the sin. And now that week, we're going to take on that leavened bread. Now, again, we are to eat on leavened bread and to put that quality of humility and righteousness, which are the characteristics of Christ. When we are eating that unleavened bread, we're putting on his character in us. We're uh, practicing what we need to be doing. So how do we apply this spiritually? Because unleavened bread, again, represents something for us. Now, for years and years that we've been in the church, we saw that there were many articles about different recipes for unleavened bread on how to make unleavened bread meals. And whenever we, whenever we see recipes, they always look difficult. At least for me, they always look difficult. All recipes look difficult. Uh, whether it's a little things that had to be done in it or a lot of things that had to be done in it, it always looked like a really hard thing to do. Especially recently when I had to make some chili. Uh, when I saw that recipe that I had to be working on, I thought, how am I going to do this? Well, but we were, we were told that the men have to be making this. And I thought, really? How, all these things I have to be doing? Uh, too hard. So whenever we see recipes, they often look very difficult to do. And in reality, things are more simple than we tend to make it. They're really more simple than what we see. Now, when, back when uh, Joanne and I were first married, my mother, I had asked my mother to teach my wife how to make pasta and meatballs. That was, you know, we were very young when we got married. She wasn't well-practiced yet on cooking, but my mom had a good background. So I asked her, can you teach her how to make pasta and meatballs? And she did, and they were perfect. Now, I use that word like that because it's my insurance to protect myself, that, it's, that it is still perfect, yes. Now, my mom did have one problem because she was always trying to improve her recipes. As the years went on and on, she would always try to do a little bit better job with it and, and work on it. So the pasta and meatballs weren't always the same as when she first gave it to my wife. They were perfect at that time. They still are, of course, thankfully. But uh, mom kept trying to increase it a little more. Well, we're similar to that, brethren, because we get frustrated in our life and we continue to beat ourselves over the head because we're rotten. We know what we are. We know we're not doing a very good job with this, with this menu that we're working on, this recipe. So we change the recipe in our lives and the process of overcoming that God wants us to do. We start to do our part in it. And we feel that unless we are suffering in our attempt to overcome, God won't be happy. So we, we think, well, I'm not doing a good job, but I know he's happy because I'm not doing a good job because I'm not good. Or that it's just too hard to do. Or I should just quit, just give it up, not, not even bother. So we get frustrated in, in, in doing that cooking of that recipe in our life, spiritually. So looking for sin and finding is not meant to discourage us. That's not what God wants for us. But rather to see what, what needs to be changed in our lives. What needs to be changed in our lives so that we can become growing by the power available to us by what God is teaching us and showing us? So the discouragement is when we try to do things like that on our own, when we don't follow the instructions on the package. We're not going to do a good job. So I'm not going to make chili anymore unless I read the recipe, of course, but <clears throat> I don't know how good a job I'll do it. So when we do things on our own, we throw out God's recipe. We're removing that recipe, and we do it on our way of doing things. God makes a perfect system for us to see on that, and we are to follow what he said. And that is a recipe of, of being spiritually unleavened. That recipe will help us to be spiritually unleavened. That's to make unleavened bread. To make unleavened bread, you need two main ingredients that are necessary. One is water, and the other is flour. Now, you can doctor it up a little, maybe use a little salt, a little garlic, a little bananas, some raisin, whatever you want to throw in there. Uh, they might fix it up. But the only things important to have there, the main things, were water and flour, two things. And the one thing not to have, of course, would be anything that had leaven in it. So unleavened bread pictures something 
that has the leaven removed from it, unleavened bread. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We see here that Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and they had a problem with them, with a, with a man that was living with his stepmother. And the brethren were very complacent to the seriousness of the man's sins. They weren't doing anything to make him stop what he was doing or whatever. And so Paul was telling them, uh, tell, uh, Paul was telling them to see how, if you don't correct the problem, you have removed, uh, you have half this fellow, uh, you will have to go along with others as well. If you don't remove the problem, it's going to take over into others as well. And it will affect them in their lives because they don't see that it's such a wrong thing to do. So I guess it's okay. So he says it's like, like leaven is expanding. So here he's telling them, this guy is doing something wrong. You've got to remove him from the congregation. But they weren't doing that because they were trying to be nice to the guy. 1 Corinthians 5, and let's read in verse 6, where Paul then tells them. He says, you're glorying or you're boasting about something or being proud for yourselves is not good. Know you not that a little leaven, leavens the whole lump, purge you therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you truly are unleavened. So he's telling them, here, get this guy out because there's sin going on, and you're letting it stay on, and it's only going to get worse and worse within the, the church, the congregation that you have. Remove the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are truly unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So we're to be putting out that leaven that represents sin from our lives. And one way that they were unleavened was by the sacrifice of Christ. That's what we are. We've been unleavened, brethren, in our life at baptism by Christ's sacrifice. We've accepted that. We've made a commitment to that to be removed from sin, to remove sin as best we can from our lives during our life. Now, spiritually, that is the only thing that unleavens us, really, spiritually, is that having God, Christ, rather, sacrifice himself and then living in us. Paul says our part, then, was to keep it out. Notice as it continues now in verse 8, 1 Corinthians 5, continuing in verse 8. He says, Therefore, let us keep the feast not with all leaven, meaning the physical leaven that we've already put out, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness. Now he's bringing up a different aspect here, of meaning unkindness and evil, meaning the sins were allowed to grow in our lives. But, he says, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now he's showing here, he's laying out for us that there are two things in these ingredients that we are to have as well in our life. Two things. One is sincerity, and that is of truth, to be like Christ, living in us. So leaven is the ingredient used in baking to make something rise. It's the leaven, when you're cooking with it, it puffs it up. It makes it more full, and it grows bigger and bigger until it fills it completely. And spiritually, brethren, leaven as sin is the same thing in us. It fills us more and more until we become so full of ourselves and selfish because now we're just full of that leaven and it gets deeper and bigger and bigger and fatter all the way. So Paul gave them instruction on how to be unleavened. Now this recipe that God outlines for us to be, is to be keeping his feast and for us then to be unleavened. So the two main ingredients for, or for us to use our sincerity and truth. Let's look first at sincerity. The meaning of sincerity is freedom from hypocrisy, disguise, or false pretense. It meaning being free of anything that is misleading in our life, avoiding things that are going to take us off track. It means clearness, clearness and purity, meaning uh, literally brightness, purification, and purifying. It also means being guileless or innocent and genuine in heart and free from deceit. Also, earnestness is another uh, definition of the word. It means seriousness, seriousness and zeal in intention and effort, being earnest to do and do something that God wants us to do, and that is to remove the leaven from us. And it means purity of intent, being without blemish. 
So this sincerity is important for us to have if we're to have this leaven removed from us. Again, being genuine to what we, des- what we strive for this week and being genuine to do that. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and in verse 1, we'll begin there. Romans 12 and verse 1. Romans 12, verse 1, Paul tells us here, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, we've got to renew our mind because it's been corrupted for all our lives, that we've had our own thinking to be done and our own way of making the recipe and our own way of overcoming things and doing things. He says we're to renew our mind to change what has been. He's making it clear what our priority must be. And we're making a conscious effort with God's help, brethren, when we do that, when we start to make the change in our life. A time of refreshing our minds as when we were baptized to remind us of what that commitment was that we made at that time. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. Let's see how Christ defines leaven. Especially the time we're living in, he's going to be expanding on expounding on what what this is all about. Luke, Luke chapter twelve, beginning in verse one. Luke twelve, verse one. Paul says here. Um, Jesus says here. Meanwhile, when a crowd or many thousands have gathered, uh, so that they were trampling one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples, and he said, "Be on your guard against the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy." So Jesus now is explaining or expanding on the fact that what leaven is, it's a sin. And one of them is the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. So one of the things that leaven represents, again, is hypocrisy, or the opposite of sincerity is hypocrisy. The opposite of sincerity. Continuing in verse 2, he says, There is nothing concealed which will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known, so a hypocrite, they can be saying things and hiding it, but it's going to come out. They'll know what it was said and done. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the roofs. They're going to be coming out loud and clear what the real mistakes were said were going to be, were going to be coming out. So the hypocrite will try to cover up, but it will become known. It will become out to be known. A hypocrite will say one thing and does another. Oh, they say all the good things, but they don't do it. Now, sincera, S-I-N-E-C-E-R-A, is the root from sincerity from the Latin, the Latin root of that word, sincerity, and it means without wax or contaminated, not being contaminated. Now, when the Romans made pots, they often sealed the base of the pot with wax, claiming that nothing contaminates, uh, but in time the wax melted or wore away, rendering the pots useless for liquids. So here the the Romans at that time were were doing something like that through history. They'd be using uh, uh, wax to put in the container when they were cooking it, when they were putting the pots together. But in time the wax melted, wore away, and rendered, rendered the pots useless. So hypocrites say their behavior is not contaminated, but rather it's genuine. Just like the Romans said about the pots. What we're doing is fine. They're genuine. But later on, they became polluted and corrupted, and they couldn't, they couldn't get over what had happened. So hypocrisy is play acting, looking outward to what is good. Christ's condemnation for what he said there is genuine. Having an outward show with no substance of heart, it tells you what you want to hear. It tells you what you want to hear, hypocrisy. Turn over to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, and in verse 1, we see here now, this is going to the priests just before Christ was going to come back. These were information that God was giving to the priests that they were to know about. And it says in Malachi one, uh, Malachi 2, verse 1, he says, And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear, and if you will not take it to heart, 
meaning you don't see the seriousness or the importance to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts. I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you do not take it to heart. So he's showing here how when God looks at this attitude of not seeing the importance of something, that we're not applying it, he says, you're going to be cursed. Just like we're going to be cut off from spiritual Israel, you're going to be cursed. Now, again, this is not just for the priests here, because later when the Pharisees came along, when Christ was here, was here, how did they take what was told to the priests to heart? How did they see that? Because those who were not totally committed to obeying God's instructions, they were going to be suffering with the end results, as would we if we're not going to obey God. So taking the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth is giving ourselves totally and taking it to heart. Taking it to heart. Not holding back some little part of our life to make ourselves happy. It's taking to heart by renewing the mind. That's how we take it to heart. Realizing, wait a minute, I'm seeing this different. I don't see things uh, about Christmas and, and Easter when I was a little boy being wrong. Now I see how wrong they are. God has opened my eyes to understand things. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. You don't have to turn there. But Jesus places emphasis, emphasis on purity of heart. Matthew 5 and verse 8, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure or the sincere in heart, for they shall see God. So he's showing here how blessed it will be to do that. Let's go back to Psalm 24. I'll turn back there. Psalm 24, well, David tells us the same thing as Christ was speaking about in Psalm 24. Psalm 24 and verse 3, we'll see here how, again, the importance and the priority of being sincere in heart to get rid of the leaven from our lives. Psalm 24 and verse 3, it says, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Verse 4, he says, He that has clean hands and a pure, sincere heart. That word pure, again, means sincere. A pure and sincere heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Not lying, not being deceitful, not being a hypocrite. Verse 5, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. Verse 6, this is the generation of them that seek him, that seek the face, face, Jacob. And that means sincerely seeking his face. That's how we are. This is the generation of those who are going to do that, the ones who will ascend to the hill of the Lord. So being pure in heart is to be genuine, no facade or something fake. No motives, not trying to impress others by what we say or what we do, but rather to desire to please God, to be sincere in how we think, how we act, and do we have that zeal and effort to be in us to be doing this? Let's go over to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, and verse 53, reading from the NIV version. John 6 and verse 53. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink, and whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. So we see here that God is providing for us the gift and the blessing from heaven to have sins removed, to have God living in us, and to have eternal life. What an incredible thing it was to come and understand what God's holy day's meaning and purpose has been. So Christ lived in a way that was totally contrary to our human way of doing things. Because human nature wants to lash out and strike back and show revenge, and that's not what Jesus did. Because Jesus was dedicated to doing the will of the Father. He wasn't upset that we wouldn't, wouldn't be doing these things. He was going to bless us in our life in spite of these things. Turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 here. Paul is talking to the ministry at the time. Titus chapter 2 and verse 7. Paul says here, In all things... 
or with respect all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, integrity, and sincerity. So he's telling him how to be preaching to people, uh, having a pattern of good works, in doctrine, and showing incorruption in what we're talking about and how we're living. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness or the sincerity of your teachings. In other words, don't be like the Pharisees. Be teaching the truth of God in a right way. Verse 8, he says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is, that, he that is of the, of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So our life, brethren, must reflect Jesus Christ in us. And that sincerity must be incorruptibility and genuine in how we're doing things. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 5. We see here more about Paul explaining the importance of the heart that's in us. Ephesians 6 verse 5, he says, Servants, be obedient to them, that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. In other words, the word here means sincerity, without self-seeking. Be yielding to your, to your masters that you have in your life, your work or your business or whatever. It is the opposite of duplicity or deceitfulness in thought or action. Verse 6, it goes on, it says, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So it's not just we're doing it to men, we're doing it to God. We're pleasing God in everything we're doing. We're showing other people the good things in our life because we're reflecting Christ's character and nature. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So if we're doing the right things, we're going to receive the blessings from the Lord. And we're not to be double-minded in our obedience to God, taking two different directions. And in the book of James, James mentions that as being unstable, having a double mind. So doing God's will means that we must constantly be drinking in of God's word that causes us to understand what his will is. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 Galatians 2 and verse 20. Again, Paul says here, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How are we living, brethren, to determine if Christ is living in us? Are we able to see these things? Are we as, as, as confident, are we as sure as Paul is saying here about himself that Christ is living in us? If we are eating the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth and making it useful in our lives, it will be that way. So sincerity is doing it from the heart. It's not a ritual. It's the number one thing in God, uh, for God to, for us to be doing in our life. Now, mere obedience is not enough, brethren. It must be number one in our life. It's not just obedience. It's got to be the most important thing that we're doing. Now, we don't have to turn there, but in Deuteronomy 6, in verse 6, in the, uh, it says here, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. So even in the Old Testament, we see here, God was telling Israel, all the words I command you, they'll be in your heart. And God is telling us that we are to be eating unleavened bread for seven days to remove the leaven from our lives and keep it out. The next thought, thought we want to look at here on this is, what is the unleavened bread of truth? Because, brethren, our world today is lacking in truth. We're living in a world that is totally corrupt. Can, you cannot believe what you're hearing, what you're reading. Even watching the news on TV is so hard because I'm thinking, how are people listening to this and doing it and believing it's right to do? How about truth in advertising? And many people say, don't confuse me with the truth. We don't want to be confused with the truth. Turn to John chapter 8. Let's see where this lack of truth started. Jesus is going to give us some information here about the background of where, why we don't have truth. John chapter 8, 
And we'll start and we'll read in verse 44. John 8, verse 44, Jesus says, you are, uh, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he abode not in the truth. And because there is no truth in him, when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So we see here that lying and lack of truth began with Satan the devil. There's no truth in him at all, Christ says. Now, we know he started 6,000 years ago with the very first couple that was sent here on the earth and telling her at the time, you shall not die. And he lied to her, and she believed him. And then she ate from the tree. And for 6,000 years, we've been cooperating with her and everything she said and did that time. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to see more about how this all began in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and beginning in verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3, says, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, because those minds, uh, whose minds, rather, are of the God of this age that has, he has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. So he's saying that these people in the world, their minds are, uh, have been blinded by the God of this world. And he will use truth, brethren, as well, to mix in with lies, to confuse and pollute the people with the truth. How many people over the last 30 years that we've been knowing that had the truth of God, how many of the last 30 years were tripped up by deception and listening to others saying things that were not true and then finally eventually left the church, period? because of that cooperating with what was told as lies. Dropping down to verse 16, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, he says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. How is that? By eating the word of God daily. Now, more of the leaven of this world is being pushed, pushed out as we continue to eat the unleavened bread of truth. So more and more of all, the more we eat in God's word, the unleavened bread of truth, more of that leaven is being pushed out of our lives because it's becoming real. We're making sure that our minds are changing. Those that God has called and opened the minds to understand the truth, they're not blinded. We're not blinded, brethren, because we have the help of God through his spirit to discern what's right and what's wrong and what's pure. We're not doing that on our own. We're doing it from his word. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at that. 1 Peter chapter 2. We see here an example of what, what the word is. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Peter says here, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile and hypocr hypocrisies and enviness and, and all evil speaking, so Paul here, uh, Peter here is telling us all the things we're going to be removing, hypocrisy, everything that is not sincere in our life. Remove all those things that are leaven. Verse 2, and as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word, we're going to be like a little child. He says that you may grow thereby. So like a little baby sees the importance of milk. They get so excited when mom comes and start feeding them with milk because it's important to them. They're getting this nourishment from that word, from that milk, rather. But here, Peter is using that as an example. As a newborn baby, we're to desire the milk of the word, God's word. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, we don't read that, but we are to, we are, uh, to be obedient children and to cry out for his nourishment. Now, milk, brethren, which is without guile, that's the kind of milk we're looking at, the pure milk of God's word with no other purpose but to nourish and benefit ourselves by eating that, that very healthy word. Now, years ago when I was in business, I had a customer that used to make ice cream. And he had a process of making the ice cream by cleaning containers that he had that, that was very strict that he had to do this. And he had only certain types of containers could be used that he was doing this with. And the concern for the bacteria that would be contaminating 
the ice cream was always present. So he had to make sure he really cleaned those containers very well, otherwise the milk products would be contaminated or polluted. Now I've done some research, I looked up that milk can be polluted. You can pollute milk if you leave it out a little too warm, too long, make the coffee in the morning, put your milk in it, and you're still drinking it at nine o'clock at night, you might see little things floating on the top of it, you know. So it may not last that long. So our having a wrong focus will pollute what we are trying to accomplish. We're not to focus on man or physical distractions. We're to be careful what we're doing with that. We are to use God's food in order to grow spiritually healthy. That, that same milk of the word. Now, again, each year, more things are designed to take our focus off of the Passover, and it doesn't stop on the 14th. You know, as we start getting closer to the Passover, we start seeing all the things going on in our life, distractions with family, friends, work, whatever, all things that are kind of get our minds off track. And it doesn't stop at the 14th. It's going to continue every day. Let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Paul says here, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in his age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Learn the lessons. That word defile the meaning of that is to, to put to waste or to shrivel or to wither, to spoil by any process or to ruin, to deprave or to corrupt. Ultimately, it's to destroy it. Just as a little bacteria can spoil milk products, brethren, that truth that we have can be polluted by things that we are allowing in our heart and mind to be listened to. We have to remember that he says here, we are like, we are the temple of God. We are God's temple. We are that container. That's, we are the spiritual container in that sense, as the, the guy making the ice cream. We are that container that Christ is in us. Are we keeping it clean? Are we doing our part to maintain that truth? Let's turn to John chapter 18. John chapter 18. John chapter 18, brethren, Christianity at large uses the same Bible that we have. I mean, they have, they have all that stuff that they look at as the truth. Yet they have Christmas, Easter, Mary worship, all these things that they have, they consider to be true. Well, wherever they heard it from was right, so that's true. John 18, verse 37. Pilate said to him, are you king then? And Jesus answered, you say that I am king, and to this end I was born. And for this cause I came into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Because everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Prior to him coming, there wasn't truth, unless God sent it through Israel and his working with them to keep some truth there through, through time. But, uh, but now that he is there, truth is coming from him, from his voice. Now, I remember hearing many times mentioned that no one has the truth. No one has all the truth. Because many today are reluctant to seek for the truth. They've been deceived to think that it's vanity to want truth. Or oh, you're being vain if you want the, the truth. Or it's elusive. Or we just can't have it. No, brethren. We have, however, as much truth that God wants us to have right now in our life. Continuing in verse 38. Pilate said unto him, Well, what is truth? And he said, uh, he said this. And he went out again unto the Jews, and he said unto them, I don't find any fault with him. You know, I don't see anything wrong. I, I can't convict him. Why was he being sarcastic or sincere when he said, What is truth? We would have the same response from people today saying, What is truth? Because they don't know what truth is. Unless God has opened the minds to understand, they don't know it. We've been blessed with that, brethren, to have that mind open to that truth. It's what is considered truth today by the world, the Big Bang Theory, where today people look at it, they believe in the Big Bang Theory. So right now we're only descendants of monkeys and frogs. 
Really? No. Our knowledge is without absolutes as being, as being invalid. That's our human knowledge, being without absolutes. The world governed by Satan and truth is based in theories. That's what they have. That's their truth. It's a theory. And conclusions are based on probability. You never have an absolute truth, and you never have proved the truth if you look into things from the world. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 here, Paul, war, Peter here warns us to be careful for what we hear. Be careful what we hear. Because some were ordained to bring heresy. 2 Peter 2 and verse 1. He said, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who prettily shall bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves sweet destruction. Verse 2, and many shall follow their per uh, pernicious, pernicious ways, by reason of whom the, the way of the truth shall be evil, evil, evil spoken. And though the covetousness shall they, shall they have with vain words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. So something that's made up and fabricated and molded like plastic is going to be passed on even through people in the ministry, as, as he was talking about here, that's going to come ahead in the future. False teachers. Turn over to Acts chapter 17. Again, when we're studying God's word, we know the truth. Now, I remember being asked years ago by someone in the church, I asked him rather, what he felt about the changes in doctrines that were coming back in those days. And he said, oh, he says, that's the minister's job. I don't have to worry about that. Yeah, Christmas, Sunday? Yeah, no, no, that's the minister's job to check that out. Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Talking here about the Bereans, Acts 17, verse 11, he says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they receive the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. They search the scriptures daily. What's the scriptures? The word of God. We're to be eating unleavened bread seven days, taking in that word of God. So they search the scriptures daily in their lives, not just once in a while, to make sure that what they were hearing was true. So the truth should be positive results in our life. And it should result in the fruits of the Spirit. Again, the world, it's without absolutes. Some people are satisfied with a little truth, enough so that it won't interfere in their lifestyle. And remember, Paul said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Eventually, it's going to get worse and worse. So we can't allow any of it to be negative to come in and let it stay there. So then how do we view the truth? Turn to John chapter 17. How do we view the truth? Truth, again, something proven to be correct, not concealing. What is it? It's God's word. Notice in Jesus' prayer in John 17, verse 17, Jesus here praying to the Father before he was going to be taken away. <clears throat> he said, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. God was, Christ was praying here that he that his word will be passed on to all of us that he is calling with his truth. Again, man's way is philosophy and vanity and ideas. God's word cleans. It purifies the heart and mind. It produces a healthy life and helps people to notice things that are going on. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So we must always check the word, uh, check what the world says compared to what God says. We have to make sure it's the absolute truth. And if it doesn't fit, it must be rejected from our life. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. Paul says here, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for, up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through his word and to present her to himself a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. 
So he says, he's telling us here, Paul, love your wives just the way Christ loved the church. Look what he did for her. He was pure and sincere. We were washed, brethren, at baptism by his word, made clear of that. We had the truth of God now available. No deception, no dispute. So then how do we use the truth? Are we letting God's word clean us up? Do we use the truth to internalize? Or do we use the, so the word as a sword in our hands to cut people off, to look down on others? Because we know so much, and you, know, you don't know anything. You're, you don't know the word of God. I know the word. God doesn't want us to be self-righteous like that. We, don't use, the, we use the word to, uh, for ourselves, for our, our use in our life, not to be condemning other people. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Again, the truth is clear and concrete. This is not a better way, but the only way. Matthew 7, verse 24. Jesus says here, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat the, that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on a rock. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built this house on the sand. And the rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew they, uh, and beat against the house, and it fell with, great, with a great crash. Verse 28, when Jesus finished the saying these things, the crowd were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. He wasn't teaching like the hypocrites were doing. The, the Pharisees were doing. He was teaching them the truth. He said, we are to put the words of God into practice in our life that will be built on his foundation. Who's the foundation? Christ is our rock and our foundation. He is the word that we are to be listening to and studying and following. He is showing here how important that word is. Our houses, our lives must be built on the rock of God's word. And those who follow it will have eternal life, brethren. Turn over to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. God's Spirit in us directs us to use words properly. James 1 and verse 22. James 1 verse 22 says, But be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like any man belonging, beholding his natural face in a glass. For behold himself and goes this way and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Verse 26. And if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So if anyone seems to be religious, but not following God's word, and not taking care of their tongue, and being careful of what they're hearing and then saying, he says, their, their religion is vain. We are to use God's word to make the changes in our life. Make the changes in our life. Turn over to second. Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, how do we view the truth? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Because we're going to know that one is soon coming that will deceive many and distort the word of God, as we read a little bit earlier. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10. It says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth or the word of God, that they might be saved. Rather, and for this cause, God shall send among them delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness or leaven. So in that time, brethren, as we come to close to the end, all the deceivableness and unrighteousness is going to continue to grow, and we have to be careful that we don't give into it. How do we view the truth? Now, let's remember also that 
It doesn't always come out perfectly the same way twice whenever we make a recipe. I, I'm not looking forward to doing the uh, cooking again for the men's club in the future in any way. I don't know if I could follow that way, but it, it doesn't always come out perfectly. I might do a good job next time or not. I don't know. But it doesn't always come out perfectly or the same way twice. It's not like somebody makes pasta and meatballs. Unleavened bread of sincerity and truth is part of the process of conversion. It takes time. It doesn't happen immediately, brethren. This overcoming, this growing that we're doing, this sincerity and truth that we're taking on, this recipe, has got to be an ongoing thing in our life. We're not just doing it for the seven days in a few weeks. Because not everything we do is going to be perfect. Turn over to Psalms 37. Psalm 37. Again, we have to realize, brethren, that we are eating, seven days we are eating this unleavened bread. What does seven re represent? It represents completeness, a full time of our life. Seven days we're eating unleavened bread, like the 7,000 years of man's whole time on earth. That last thousand years, the seventh day of the, the Sabbath represents the millennium. Here we see now that that seventh week, that week that we are keeping this, that seven days, represents the completeness in our life. So it doesn't end just with the, with the Passover and unleavened bread. We're going to continue doing that. Our whole life is to be eating unleavened bread spiritually every day of our life. And even during the week, that week, you know, we eat unleavened bread every day. And we don't do it again to be, you know, making sure we're doing the, eating the unleavened bread. No, that unleavened bread is representing something that's important for us. It's not eating the, the matzah. It's what that thing represents. It's a reminder every day when we eat that bread, it's a reminder that we are to be eating the unleavened bread of Christ living in us. That's how we are eating that on a daily matter. Psalms 37 and verse 23 it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So, brethren, we see how encouraging it is for us to know that no matter what's happening in our life, that we're doing that. We're not 100% accurate every time. And even that we're using the recipe, we're not perfectly doing it every single day. How encouraging it is that we can be successful through God's help. We have his hand in our life. So whenever we make a mistake, God is there for us. He doesn't walk away from us. Turn to Ezra chapter 6. Ezra chapter 6. We're reading here in verse 22. It says now that they, they came out of the time that they were away. He said, they came to the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hearts in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. So here we see that at this time, what they were doing, they were having joy. It wasn't a time of discouragement, a time of worrying of why, why we're here, what we're doing here that's not good enough for God. We're to be joyful as they were at that time. We have a purpose and a focus of what Christ has made available for us. Let's turn over to Joshua chapter 24, last scripture we'll look at today. Joshua chapter 24. At the end of Joshua's time of serving God, for that time after Moses was died, and Joshua took over. So during all that time, now at the end of that time, when he, just before he was going to die, he was speaking to God's people. Joshua 24 and verse 14. He says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve you the Lord. And if it seem evil to do unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether it's the gods of your fathers that uh, your father served while you were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, or those uh, or in those land you dwell. But you notice what he says here at the end. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That has to be our mindset and attitude, brethren. We're to serve God in sincerity and truth. All those years that Israel had been set free, they were doing a lot of things wrong while they were going through the, the, uh, 
the wilderness, complaining and groaning. But God was going to bring them out to freedom and to a promised land. We're there, brethren. He has brought us out of this corrupt world to his promised land now. And we're waiting for his return, and we need to be doing our part. So the world we're living in today, brethren, is living by the leaven of the one who is out of truth. And unleavened bread pictures are coming out of that world to the way of God and Christ. So let's use, or let's rather, not be physically unleavened, but rather be committed to a new way. Let's use this wonderful recipe that God has given to us in our hearts to be filled with sincere motives and eagerness to apply pure truth from God's word. Let's be sure, brethren, that we put on the mind of Christ and let's not be eating the unleavened bread and be sure that we are eating the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth.